All right, who do you follow? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2 of Ephesians chapter 5 in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. This is from uh, this is the letter of, from Paul to the Ephesian church. He says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Follow God's example. My message today entitled, Who Do You Follow? You know, one thing that I, that, that I see and understand is that children are natural imitators. You guys ever notice that? Recognize that? Children are natural imitators. Let me ask you, when you were a kid, and for some of you, you may have to think way, <laughs> way back. <laughs> but when you were a kid, who did you imitate? Who did you imitate when you were, especially when you were a little kid? Was it someone that you saw on TV? Was it an athlete? Was it your older brother or your older sister? Was it one of your parents? But who did you imitate when you were little? I remember when I was when I was little, I, I would I remember watching Evil Knievel. Anybody remember Evil Knievel? I remember watching Evil Knievel jump his motorcycle over all these amazing things. And then at, after watching that, I would go outside with my friends and we would build ramps. And we would jump our bikes over stuff because we wanted to imitate evil can evil. And it was natural. It was just automatic. We saw it and we just wanted to imitate it. We didn't have to think about it. We didn't have to plan it. We didn't have to calendar it. We didn't have to analyze our behavior as far as, it was just natural, automatic. We were natural imitators. The Apostle Paul here is telling us to go back, to go back to that automatic imitation of God. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to. You don't have to calendar it. You don't have to analyze your behavior. It's just automatic. Instead of imitating Evil Knievel or Wonder Woman, he tells us to become imitators of God. Imitators of God. It should be natural for a Christian. It should be natural for a Christian to imitate God. Because we are, as he says, dearly loved children of God. As dearly loved children, it should be natural for us to imitate God. Now, when you hear that, some of you might think, uh, well, that sounds like a pretty tall order. <laughs> How do we imitate God? I don't know about you, I've never personally seen him, so how do I imitate God? God is so complex. How do I imitate God? 
Paul actually narrows it down. He narrows our focus here. He says that we can imitate God by living a life of love. Living a life of love. Because God is what? Love. God is love. So we can imitate God by living a life of love. And then he directs our eyes to Jesus' life on the earth. And Jesus' life on the earth should be the model that we can follow. The model that we can imitate. Jesus lived a life of love. And it says here in verse 2 that Jesus gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what I want to do this morning is I want to show you guys three examples. Three things that we see Jesus do that we can imitate. Because it should be natural for us as believers. If you're a believer here today. It should be natural for us to imitate God. And here's three things that I want to show you that Jesus did that we can imitate. Imitate that God wants us to imitate. So here's number one. Number one is that Jesus disregarded his position. He disregarded his position. We see this in Philippians chapter 2. So you, you can go with me there to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 3. We're going to read verses 3 through 8. Philippians chapter 2. Paul says this to the Philippian church. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Man, there, there's a lot to unpack in that passage. There's a lot to, to unpack. But for what we're talking about today, the first way that we can imitate God the first way that we can imitate Jesus since we are disciples if you're a Christian you're a you should be a disciple since we're his disciples the first way we can imitate Jesus is by cutting out all selfish ambition and pride All selfish ambition and pride. Let me say this. Ambition is not a bad thing. Ambition is a good thing. You should want to improve your life. You should want to, to get better. You should want to make your to do the things that you need to do to make your life better. If you you should go to school, you should take classes, you should develop yourself, you should do all those things. Ambition is a good thing. Selfish ambition is not a good thing. 
Because selfish ambition involves hurting other people to get what you want. Mm -hmm. That's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. The key word there is selfish. Now, there is a selfish test that I felt like we should, we should do this. <laughs> And, and it's in the, it's an, um, it, this selfish test is a nod to Jeff Foxworthy's test of, you might be a redneck, <laughs> but this is a selfish test. Here we go, number one, if the last time you said, I love you, and you really meant it, but you were looking in a mirror, you might have a problem with self. Number two, if you always know more than the people you hire to do a job, you might have a problem with self. Here's number three, if you have come to the conclusion that nobody and I mean nobody really knows how to do anything without your advice. <laughs> you might have a problem with self. Mm -hmm. And for all of you who have somehow been able to handle these three and think to yourself, I'm good, I'm, I, I, I don't have an issue, I obviously don't have an issue with self. Let me give you this qualifier. If you were born after the fall of man in the garden, <laughs> if you were born after that and before the second coming of Jesus, <laughs> you probably have a problem with self. <laughs> Amen. Let's go back to Philippians 2. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Isn't it interesting that he says the interests of the others? He's talking about relationships within the church. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death, on a cross. The Bible teaches that God is not a respecter of persons. God is not a respecter of people. And what that means is, he, God doesn't treat people differently because of their personal wealth, their race, um, their economic situation, their education level, what kind of car they drive. God doesn't treat people differently because of the different situations that they're in. So because God doesn't do that, we shouldn't do that either. People are people. Mm -hmm. And you guys have heard me talk about this. Mm -hmm. You can go anywhere in the world and you'll find people are people. Same as you. But there's something, listen, there is something within all of us that we have to fight, and that is the need to 
categorize people. It's in all of us. This thing that we have to categorize people. We have to put people in boxes and make assumptions about them. And unfortunately, <clears throat> those boxes determine who we interact with and who we choose to not interact with. And the worst part, I think, <laughs> this, the worst time ever that this happens is during an election year. Boxes. I'll interact with these people, I don't interact with these people. Which side are you on? It's going to determine whether I talk to you or whether I don't talk to you. It's in all of us. I was reading something recently from Donald Miller from his book. He has a book called Blue Like Jazz. And in this book, he talks about how God convicted him of this thing of categorizing people and putting people in boxes and determining who, who he liked and who he didn't like and, and, and all of this. And this is, he's talking about within the context of the church. <coughs> he said this, he said, there's a guy in my life at the time, he said, a guy I went to church with whom I honestly didn't like. I thought he was sarcastic and lazy and manipulative and he ate with his mouth open so that food fell from his chin when he talked. That automatically put some, that guy, that dude was in a, in a box. It was like, I don't hang out with that. And he said, and he began and ended every sentence with the word dude. <laughs> he said, I be he began to get under my skin. I wanted him to change. I wanted him to read a book, memorize a poem, explore morality, at least from an, an, an uh, intellectual concept. He said, I didn't know how to communicate with him. Especially that he needed to change. So I displayed it on my face. I rolled my eyes. I gave him dirty looks. I would mouth the word loser when he wasn't looking. I thought somehow he would sense my disapproval and change his life in order to gain my favor. He said, I withheld love for him. He said, I knew what I was doing was wrong. It was selfish. And what's more, it would never work. Anybody ever figured that part out? <laughs> it would never work. By withholding love from him, he became defensive. And he didn't like me. He thought I was judgmental, snobbish proud and mean. Rather than being drawn to me, wanting to change, he was repulsed. I was guilty of using love like money, withholding it to get somebody to be who I wanted them to be. And I was making a mess of everything and I was disobeying God. If Jesus our master was known as a friend of tax collectors and sinners, we have to ask ourselves as his disciples, how often do I befriend the outcast? Or am I part of the group that has cast them out? Do I eat and drink with sinners? I thought it was such a powerful picture 
of what can happen when we put people in boxes and we we decide I don't like that person I'm not going to hang out with that person I'm not going to interact with that person I am not I'm not going to disregard my position in order to befriend that person or connect with that person the first way that we can imitate Jesus is by cutting out all selfish ambition and pride. Here's number two. The second thing Jesus did that we can imitate is that Jesus restrained himself. He disregarded his position, but he also restrained himself. Let's go to Mark 15. Mark 15, starting at verse 1. It says, Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. There's lots of examples of Jesus restraining himself. But I was really drawn to this one. Because in many ways, I think, the hardest thing to do sometimes is to simply be quiet. It's one of the hardest, <laughs> hardest things to do is to just shut up. The Christian life, if you haven't figured this out yet, newsflash, <laughs> the Christian life is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. Jesus shows us and teaches us that in many ways, the Christian life is a sacrifice. If you're in it to get something, you're in the wrong, <laughs> you're in the wrong camp. Because the Christian life is a sacrifice. There's lots of different images that fill our minds when we hear the word sacrifice. But I bet most of us wouldn't think that shutting up would be one of them. But it is. It is. Restraint is a sacrifice. Put yourself in Jesus' position here in Mark 15. Lots of accusations and lies are being spoken about you. Flat out lies and accusations spoken about you. Those lies will impact your life. Your, those lies will, will determine whether you live or die. What would you do? I think most of us would defend ourselves. That's not true. That's not true. That's a lie. That's not true. Let me let me tell you my let me let me tell you my you know my perspective. Wouldn't you want to defend yourself in a situation like that? Wouldn't you even want to turn the tables 
and bring up the stuff that they had done. I mean, think about this is Jesus. He's God. He knows everything about every single person that's out there yelling at him. He could have said, name people by name. Hey, Joe, what about what you did last Friday night with that woman? What about, what about your gambling issue? What about the fact that you're an alcoholic or you're, you're doing prescription drugs? Or he, could have, he could have blasted every single person in that, that, you know, in that mob. He knew their secrets. He could have said a lot, but it says that he didn't say one word. And that pilot, was amazed. You probably never seen anyone in that position just silent. That <laughs> is some serious restraint. Mm -hmm. Serious restraint. There's a principle here that the Bible's trying to teach us. <laughs> I remember hearing T.D. Jakes talk about this. He said that something I thought was really, really, I've always listened to what he said and I've tried to apply it to my life. He says that God gets glory every time you restrain what you would normally say or do. God gets glory every time you restrain yourself from saying or doing what you would normally say or do. He said it's like, it's like incense to God. It's a fragrant offering. And it's a fragrant offering because it's a sacrifice. I could say this, but I'm not going to. I could do this, but I'm not going to. It's a sacrifice. It's a fragrant offering. Now, <coughs> every single one of us is different. And so what would be a restraint for you might be easy for me. And what would be a restraint for me might be easy for you. Everybody's different. But so whether it's a restraint of some addictive thing, you know, like eating or alcohol or sex or drugs or spending too much money, you restrain yourself from doing something that you would normally do, that's a sacrifice. What about gossip? Oh, I just, my friend just told me the, the juiciest thing. This is the biggest thing. The whole community, you know, needs to hear about this. I can't wait to call so-and-so. Oh, wait, hold up. I'm not going to make that call. That's a restraint. That's a fragrant offering unto the Lord because it's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. When we show restraint, it's a fragrant offering to God. Jesus restrained himself. Here's number three, the last one. Jesus put others' needs above his own. He put others' needs above his own. Let's go to Mark chapter two. Starting in verse 15. It says, While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Unlike the religious leaders of the day, Jesus called the, the, the religious leaders, he called them the righteous. But what he really meant was the self-righteous. The tax collectors and the sinners were honest enough to admit that they needed help. You know, when you think about it, that was the difference between the righteous and the sinners. The sinners were humble enough to admit that they needed help. <clears throat> They, they were the ones that wanted to hear Jesus' message of forgiveness, freedom from addictions, and, and the negative influences in their lives. Because they knew that that message of forgiveness and freedom was going to make a difference in their lives. And they wanted that. And they were humble enough to admit it. They didn't pretend that everything was all right. How about you? Can you admit your need? Can you admit your need for what Jesus has to offer? Or, or are you in the I'm fine group? I'm fine. I'm good. Need forgiveness? No, I'm good. Mercy? Kindness? I, I'm, I'm doing great, doing, doing fine. Want some freedom, direction? Nah, I'm, I'm cool. In a couple weeks on uh, October 31st, our parking lot is gonna be filled with, the, with people in the, nah, I'm good, category. It's heartbreaking It's heartbreaking to see the elephant in the room <coughs> when you see somebody's life who is completely jacked up and the elephant is in the room and you ask them so do you need do you need help nah I'm good man I'm cool It's heartbreaking To see the obvious hurt, the obvious lack of freedom, and yet they say, I'm fine, I'm good, man. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Man, what a warning. Jesus came, Jesus came because he knew we weren't fine. If we were fine, if we were good, if we were cool, Jesus would never have come. He came because he knew we weren't. And Jesus was incredibly disappointed and brokenhearted when people who needed him the most told him, no thanks, man, I'm good. I'm cool. And he still gets that same response today. 
But his love for you was so great that even while you're telling him, I'm, I'm fine, I'm, I'm good, he still went ahead and suffered a humiliating death so that one day, hopefully, you would be honest enough, humble enough to admit your need for what he has to offer. <clears throat> that, you guys, that's love. Mm -hmm. That is love. And that sacrifice is a sweet fragrance to the Father. Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, it says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue. And that rescue is the key word in this passage. To rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Jesus lived a life of love. Jesus' life was essentially a rescue mission. It was a rescue mission for you and for me. How will we respond to the one who came to rescue us? You can't blame anyone else but yourself if you don't respond to the one who came to rescue you. And the one who continues to rescue you. And for those of us who have been rescued, will we now imitate the one who rescued us and work with him to rescue others? Will we live a life of love in that way? Will we care enough to pray for those? Will we care enough to, to elevate their need above our own? All three years that we've talked about today, disregarding your position, restraining yourself, and putting others' needs ahead of your own, all of those things we can do. And all of those things are how we imitate God, how we imitate Jesus. And so I want to encourage each of you to become imitators of Jesus. Your life, if you do, your life will be a fragrant offering unto the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to encourage all of you that are watching to continue to give faithfully to Celebration Church. There's so many different ways that you can do that. Of course, you can mail, mail, uh, mail it in or drop by our location, which is 990 Meadowgate Road in Meta Vista, uh, California, 95722. You can give online a couple of different ways. You, know, you can always use PayPal. Use the PayPal address of one celebration at sbcglobal.net, or you can go to our our website, our church website, which is www.ccfellowship.org. Go to the home page, go up to the About Us uh, tab, pull that down, and go to the to Give Now, and then there's a donate button that'll take you to our online giving page. And uh, text giving is available as well. That's our, it's probably the fastest way to give to our church. And that is you text the word give, text the word give to area code 
4500 and you can uh, give your tithe and offering uh, to, to celebration that way as well. And uh, always, if you're watching on our YouTube channel at Celebration Church Office, subscribe and click like. We are so glad you decided to join us today. We hope you were blessed and encouraged. If you gave your life to Christ or want to reach out to us in any way, please email us at celebrationchurch13 at gmail.com. To purchase new Ann Lee worship CDs and songbooks, click the links below. God bless you.